You don't often hear a U.S. president, past or present, talking about his mistakes and shortcomings in office. But you will hear it tonight from the 39th president of the United States, Jimmy Carter. It turns out that during his four-year term, President Carter kept a diary that he's now publishing, along with an often harsh critique of his own performance in the White House. His tenure, which I covered as the CBS News White House correspondent, was tumultuous. The problems he confronted kept mounting, and people wondered if he was cursed by a dismal economy, poor relations with Congress, and a nightmarish standoff over 52 Americans held hostage by Iran. After just one term, he was trounced by Ronald Reagan. Well, now Mr. Carter takes a look back at those years in excerpts from the diary he dictated into a tape recorder seven or eight times virtually every day he was president. The story will continue in a moment. In his office at the Carter Library in Atlanta... Can I look? Yeah, you're yeah. welcome to look. The former president, now 85, and still flashing his famous smile, showed me some of the 5,000 pages that make up his diary. When American citizens get this book, what do you think is going to surprise them the most? I think the absolute, unadulterated frankness of what I had to say. Uh, I'll just give you one example. Take Kennedy. If there's anyone Mr. Carter fumes over in his diary, it's Ted Kennedy, his nemesis. Here's what he wrote when they clashed uh, on health care. Kennedy, continuing his irresponsible and abusive attitude, immediately <laughs> condemned our health plan. He couldn't get five votes for his plan. He drove you up the wall. I don't know if I ever got up the wall. But his comments on Kennedy are harsh, even now, after his death. The fact is that we would have had comprehensive health care now, had it not been for Ted Kennedy's deliberately blocking the legislation that I proposed in 1978 or 79. And you blame Teddy for the failure. Exactly. Health care, his issue. Exactly. It was his fault. Ted Kennedy killed the bill. Just to spite you? Is that the, what you're... That's the implication. That's the implication. He did not want to see me have a major success in that realm of uh, American life. It still smarts that Kennedy ran against him in 1980. Back then, he poured his resentments into his diary in frustrated, snarky outbursts, the hardworking, born-again peanut farmer up against privileged Kennedy royalty. You write angrily, he's my age, but unsuccessful, he was kicked out of college. You know, you could have left that out of the book. Well, I didn't try to conceal anything. I tried to put down exactly how I felt. Well, you went at each other. Well, you know, I felt like he went after me. I was the incumbent president. I didn't go after him. But he decided that he was going to replace me as a Democratic president. When he turns to focus on himself, he admits his critics had a valid point when they accused him of micromanaging and that he went too far with his no-frills, anti-imperial approach, as when he carried his own bags and wore cardigan sweaters in the White House. You may have depomped a little too much. One of the most unpleasant things I, I, I was, that surprised me was when I quit having Hail to the Chief played every time I entered a, a room. But there was an outcry of condemnation. So he had to reverse himself. This is our master bedroom. This is the apartment he stays in at the Carter Center when he's in Atlanta. By the looks of it, he's a no-frills ex-president, too. A Murphy bed. And this is it here. No. Yeah. The former president of the United States. And the first lady. And the first lady sleep on a Murphy bed? Absolutely. Oh, my God. 35 acres here. The president and Mrs. Carter spend time here with their children, 12 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. You are going to the Shanghai Wells Fair? Absolutely. Oh, it's so cool. Yes, that's Amy, who was nine when she moved into the White House, now 42 and pregnant with her second child. I asked her and her brothers Chip and Jeff about life at the White House. The worst thing was a little bit of intrusion by the press, but we had Amy to take all the I scrutiny, know, you know, thinking. so it, Amy got that, we didn't. You got a lot of it, Amy. I did, I, you know, I really, it's hard for me to remember that. 
Now, breaking her silence after 30 years, Amy says about her time in the White House. There was a house full of people. All the people who worked there were so wonderful. I was young. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun? Who didn't think poor little Amy was unhappy back then? She seemed bored reading books at state dinners and was hounded by the press her first day at public school in Washington. The little girl looked woebegone. Like, I look so morose, but I think that's just an accident. I was more worried about the first day of school oh, in yeah. a new place. I didn't think I even noticed the press being there. But it's a, overall a very happy time for me. But not so happy for her father, who now admits he alienated too many members of Congress, whom he described as a bunch of juvenile delinquents. He tells about some Democrats who approached him with a quid pro quo. We'll vote for your bill if you'll appoint our choice for U.S. attorney. And here's what you write. You said, I told them, in a nice way, to go to hell. Uh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Almost deliberately antagonizing them. There were times when uh, a Congress member would try to blackmail me or when a Congress member would make a demand that I thought was inappropriate. And, uh, and they would say it's the normal give and take of, of, getting, of getting legislation done. But you <clears throat> considered it blackmail. In a few occasions, yes. Congress thought he was sanctimonious, and he writes that he made things worse by proposing too many unpopular bills like the treaty to give back the Panama Canal and lifting price controls on gasoline. Even Mrs. Carter told him he was doing too much. And he would always say to me, suppose I don't have a second term. And um, he was right. Because he got an awful lot done for the country. He was not a failed president. That image of a failed president haunts the Carters. How do you think you got into this big mess? The public will have to judge how big a mess it is. The country was in a big mess with gasoline lines and double-digit inflation, and he seemed powerless to deal with it. He writes that his own loyalists asked, can you govern the country? And he tells about a brutal meeting with his cabinet. They told you that you had an image of weakness. You write that they told you this. Sure, and they A did. lack of esteem in the public eye and they just beat up on you. I think they were telling me that uh, the public image of me was that I was not a strong leader, that I should not only arouse uh, support from affection, but also from fear. So did you change? Did you start to operate from fear? <laughs> Maybe a little bit more than I would have earlier. <laughs> He tried inspiring the country with his so-called Malay speech, but it came off as lecturing Americans about their wasteful ways. Too many of us now tend to worship self-indulgence and consumption. Then talk about everything that can go bad going bad. The actions of Iran have shocked the civilized world. Iran captured 52 Americans and held them hostage for the entire last quarter of Carter's presidency. There was an attempt to rescue the hostages, but it had to be aborted, and people began calling on Carter to bomb Tehran. He refused. We went through four years. Uh, we never fired a bullet. We never dropped a bomb. We never launched a missile. Because of your religious views? That's part of it, because I felt that our country should be, as a superpower, the champion of peace. Oh. And some people will, will criticize that, have criticized sure. that attitude, as saying that in Jimmy Carter's time we didn't look as strong. We didn't look like a superpower. There's no doubt that usually a president's uh, public uh, image is enhanced by going to war. That never did appeal to me. Carter argues that despite the image of failure, he actually had a long list of successes, starting with bringing all the hostages home alive. He normalized relations with China, brokered a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, deregulated railroads, trucking, airlines, and telephones, and his energy conservation programs resulted in a 50% cut in imported oil, down to just 4.3 million barrels a day. Unfortunately, now we are probably importing 12 million barrels a day since part of my energy policies were abandoned. Well, and you built solar panels 
on the roof of the White House. That's right, which were ostentatiously removed as soon as Ronald Reagan became president. He wanted to show that America was a, a great nation, so great that we didn't have to limit the uh, enjoyment of life. And the public seemed to like that better. And they so, liked well, your message, was, which was we have to be limiting. That's right. Uh, America responded to that quite well. But when all is said and done, and many will be surprised to hear this, Jimmy Carter got more of his programs passed than Reagan and Nixon, Ford, Bush 1, Clinton, or Bush 2. I had the best batting average in the Congress in recent history of any president except uh, Lyndon Johnson. And yet, as I say, there's a sense that you were a failed president. I think I was uh, identified as a failed president because I wasn't reelected. The lesson, getting a lot of legislation passed, even when it's significant, is not enough. A lot of critics of yours when you were president say that you've been a fantastic ex-president. You hear that all the time. <laughs> I don't mind that. You like that? <laughs> I don't mind, yes. President and Mrs. Carter devote their lives to fighting disease in poor countries and resolving conflicts, as when he recently obtained the release of an American held in North Korea. It's been a life of good works and good reviews. So this is the Nobel. In 2002, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts at global diplomacy. But he was called undiplomatic when he broke the code that ex-presidents don't criticize their successors. About Reagan, you said, if I had been president for four more years, we wouldn't have had a resurgence of racism and selfishness. Now, that's pretty pointed. That's an ouch. Yeah. I don't remember when I said that, but I can't deny that I felt that way. But are you suggesting that he stoked racism? No, I, I'm not. When, but that's what that kind of suggests. But there may have been times when I was too outspoken in criticizing an incumbent president. I can't deny that. And that's probably why he's had frosty relations with other ex-presidents. He chided Bill Clinton over Monica Lewinsky and called George W. Bush the worst president in history. And when George Bush Sr. was in office, Carter wrote a secret letter to the UN calling on the Security Council to vote against the resolution to go to war against Saddam Hussein. To write and ask UN security members to vote against the United States. I also sent a copy of the same letter to President Bush. Well, I'm sure he loved reading that. Well, but did you go too far? I felt very deeply about, about the fact that the war was not necessary. So you don't regret that? No. And this is where we live? <laughs> it's been 30 years since the Carters moved back to their old house in Plains, Georgia. He has said they left Washington in despair. Did either of you ever miss Washington? I didn't. I did. Yo, you did? <laughs> really? When they're here in Plains, they both work on their books and on keeping in shape, though he's no longer the physical fitness fanatic he was as president when he jogged up to 40 miles a week. Still running? I had to quit running when I was 80 years old because my left knee began to swell up. It was as a result of an injury that I suffered when I was 70 years old on the ski slopes. Now, if you happen to be in Plains, Georgia, you just might catch a glimpse of the former president and first lady swerving along the back roads in their latest form of exercise. Yeah, but it's a tricycle, Mr. President. You're on a tricycle. They call it a trike, yeah. It's been a good life, and if the Carters...